We're in the fifth week of the Easter season and the fifth week of our Easter message series. And we've been looking at influence. Influence. Influence is force. And it can be a compelling force, a compelling force affecting the actions and behaviors, the opinions and thought of others, and eventually the outcomes they experience. We've been looking at the influence specifically as regards Jesus of Nazareth, a man who grew up in obscurity in a working class household in an impoverished outpost of the Roman Empire. He never wrote a book, commanded an army, held political office, headed a company. He was not wealthy. He didn't even have a permanent address. And yet, He's had more influence in our Western civilization and in many ways the whole world than any person who ever lived. Such is the influence of Jesus of Nazareth. But how did he do it? Well, as we've seen in the course of this series, he did it by introducing a movement. The New Testament tells us this movement was called the Ecclesia. And as we've seen in this series, ecclesia is a Greek word referring to a group of people who come together on behalf of the larger community with the intention of influencing the larger community. The ecclesia isn't only about or even primarily about the people already in the ecclesia. It's about the people who aren't in the ecclesia. Jesus came to, to initiate a movement like that, and of course, we call it the church. Jesus intended the church to be the continuation of the influencing movement that he introduced. And so, in this series, we've been looking at ways that we, as a church community, can positively influence people around us. And as we've said throughout this series, we have a very specific focus. The COVID ordeal of the last year has impacted all of us in many ways and raised many concerns. One of the most widely shared concerns is the negative impact it's having on our children and young people from academic standing to mental health. While our kids and students have experienced many losses in this COVID year, we're determined to make sure their faith in Christ is not one of them. Instead, we propose to meet this moment as an opportunity to rededicate ourselves to the formation, the education, and the celebration of faith that we want our young people to experience here at Nativity as, please God, we reopen our next generation programs, all of them, this fall. So, last week, I invited your support for our Next Generation ministry by making an investment in that ministry, specifically by serving with us or praying with us. The good news is that hundreds and hundreds of you responded positively to my invitation. Thank you very much. That's the good news, but the even better news is that you can still get involved and sign up. To participate, it's as easy as can be. Just text NEXT to 410-216-5534, and we'll take it from there. This week, we're looking at the importance of offering encouragement to others. Encouragement to others uh, as a powerful way to positively influence them. Encouragement. Encouragement means providing someone else with support, confidence, courage, equipping and inspiring them with hope. You know, if you look back on the successes that you've had in life, you could probably point to someone or several someones who encouraged you, especially when that encouragement came at key moments or critical junctures. Maybe you doubted your abilities or questioned your motives or simply wanted to quit. And, and someone's encouragement or even a single word of encouragement made all the difference. 
For me, my mother was my earliest, biggest, and best encourager. She was always filled with gratitude and enthusiasm, and it had a tremendous impact on me. Later, in college here at Loyola, I was especially encouraged by a professor there, Dr. Sue Abramitis, who then, and throughout my adult life, even now, has remained a source of encouragement, especially when it's come to our book projects in recent years. She's been a real cheerleader for me and my co-author, Tom. On the other hand, I remember another professor I had at Loyola, whose name I will not mention, who never, never ever, not once offered me a single word of praise or encouragement, much as I looked for it and worked for it. And here's the thing. Towards the end of my senior year, by chance, I happened to overhear this guy singing my praises to someone else. Not that I bear a grudge. We see the power and impact of encouragement throughout Scripture in many places. One comes to us today in our reading from the Acts of the Apostles, which tells of a special friendship between two central figures of the Church of the Apostles. After Jesus, probably no one impacted and influenced the development of Christianity more than St. Paul. If not for St. Paul, and his missionary zeal, his unflagging travel, his extensive writing, Christianity would probably have remained a small, insignificant Jewish sect lost in the Middle East. But God chose Paul as his instrument for spreading the gospel into Western Asia, Greece, and eventually Rome, and there, by extension, the whole world. He wrote almost half of the New Testament, his writings form the basis for much of the theology and doctrine of Christianity. They have been the subject of serious scholarship for two millennia, generating more sermons and seminars, more dissertations and doctorates, even whole religious denominations than any other writings from the ancient world. But his writings also provided the basis for practical Christian living. Paul was personally responsible for the conversion of thousands as he planted numerous churches in many places. But those early Christian communities struggled to get along with one another and practically live out their Christian faith. So Paul offered them counsel and direction, setting the foundation for precisely how to live the Christian life. But while Paul became the greatest promoter of Christianity and the church, initially, initially, he was the church's greatest enemy. Early on in his life, he persecuted followers of Jesus, viewing their behavior as dangerous deviation from Orthodox Judaism. Under his direction and effort, Christians were rounded up and imprisoned, sometimes even executed in an ongoing effort to wipe out Christianity. But his life changed one day while traveling on the road to Damascus on his way to arrest still more Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial. The risen Jesus appeared to him and asked him a simple question, why do you persecute me? And through that encounter, Paul came to realize that God was calling him to promote the very movement that he was trying to destroy. And while it was God who called him to this next chapter in this new work, Paul still had one little problem in the form of the other disciples. When Paul arrived at Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. Peter and James and the other apostles, the entire church leadership, and much of the church itself were all congregated in Jerusalem at this point. Obviously, if the gospel was ever going to spread and the church grow, 
they very much needed someone in sales to get the word out to the rest of the world. And Paul believed he was just the man to do it. But the other disciples want nothing to do with him because of his previous persecution of them. And their position was perfectly understandable. Why should they listen to him, much less trust, entrust him with a critical role in their mission? That very well could have been the end of Paul's story, had it not been for the other principal figure in this episode. And unlike Paul, you perhaps never heard of him or paid much attention to his role in the story. His name was Barnabas. Barnabas then took charge of him, Paul, and brought him to the apostles. And he reported to them how he had seen the Lord and that he had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. The apostle Barnabas steps in. The name Barnabas, ironically, means son of encouragement. And clearly, he was full of encouragement. And as a result of Barnabas's in encouragement, Paul is accepted by the early church leaders, at least eventually. With their approval, Paul gets to work preaching and teaching far afield of Jerusalem, bringing God's word to the whole of the Roman Empire. Their approval and basically, fundamentally, Barnabas's encouragement unleashes Paul's natural passions and newfound purpose. Practically, the rest of the book of Acts of the Apostles is the book of the Apostle Paul's acts and activities. And what's the result of all his activity? The church grew. The church grew. The church grew basically because Barnabas stepped in as an encourager for Paul and helped him connect with the apostles. And as we go on to read, many, many more times would Barnabas serve in just this role as supporter, encourager, and coach to Paul. Without Paul, there would be no church, no New Testament as we know it. But without Barnabas, there would have been no Paul. Sometimes, oftentimes, the greatest impact that we can have on the world is not by what we actually do ourselves, but by who we influence and encourage to do good and great things. All of us have the capacity and probably plenty of opportunities when it comes to encouragement. Like Barnabas, we can have an impact far beyond ourselves when we choose to encourage others. And from Barnabas, we can learn key lessons on how to do it. I count five of them in this story. First, believe in others. Take your focus off yourself and look for someone, someone younger or less experienced or less confident or less clear than you are and believe in them. Barnabas could encourage Paul because he had a generous spirit, which we learn about earlier in Acts. From what we know, Barnabas seemed to live the whole of his life on the lookout for ways to encourage everyone around him to succeed. What a great way to live your life, encouraging others. Encouraging others begins by being on the lookout for people to believe in. Two, express that belief in words and actions. We all need others who believe in us and say so. Back in college, it did me no good whatsoever that my professor had a high opinion of me because he never told me, because I never knew it. Barnabas spoke for Paul to the apostles in front of Paul. Recently, I was reminded of something I did in this regard that I didn't even realize at the time. Many years ago, we actually had a bulletin. Remember those church bulletins? Well, 
On the back of our bulletin, my name was always listed along with the address and telephone number of the church, just my name, no one else's. That's the way they did it. But at some point, I decided to change that, and I added Tom's name, too. Totally unbeknownst to me, Tom took that as a hugely encouraging sign that I believed in him and his potential. And I guess you could say things worked out pretty well from there. Three, emphasize strengths. Barnabas could emphasize the strengths of Paul because he had seen him preach in Damascus, arguing Paul's case with the apostles he impresses on them how potentially effective Paul would be in the early Christian movement precisely to his greatest strength, preaching. Powerful form of encouragement is simply emphasizing someone's strength in front of them to someone else. Be especially on the lookout for opportunities to praise them in front of their friends and family. That can mean quite a lot. Number four, instill confidence in the face of failure. Barnabas stepped up to support Paul when he needed it most, precisely as he was being rejected by the other apostles. People need encouragement the most when they're most vulnerable, when they've made a mistake, when they've fallen or failed. Let them know that you still have their back. Young people especially are absolutely going to make mistakes and bad choices and demonstrate a lack of judgment that just goes with the territory. But you know what? We all do too, at least from time to time. That's why encouragement is most effective when we need it most. People who persevere through problems often have role models who have encouraged them to interpret their problems as opportunities to learn and grow. Besides, there is no success without setbacks and failures. Finally, five, encourage by expecting success. Barnabas anticipated that Paul would be a rock star when he came to spreading the faith, and he was right. We have to develop the very best view of what others are capable of achieving, and then speak that into their lives. Speak success into their lives. So, who is one person? Just one person. God perhaps is calling you to encourage this week. The first step is to name the person. Perhaps right now, in this very moment, the Holy Spirit is giving you the name of someone at work, at school, at, at home that needs encouragement, that needs your encouragement this week. Who is it? So many people are in desperate need of encouragement, and it might be your words, your action, your concern, your support that makes an impact on them and has an impact far beyond them. In that sense, your encouragement isn't just encouragement, it's a blessing. 